Hello and welcome to the Certificate in Organic Horticulture. Well, this show, we're in Urnsklu, beautiful Urnsklu near Alexandra, and we're going to look at some tasty organically grown apples. Summer Fruits Organic Unit is located in Urnsklu, which is a few minutes drive from Alexandra in sunny central Otago. The orchard is split into two units. One is dedicated to the production for distribution of organic apple varieties, and the other more sizeable operation is located further up the road and produces pip and stone fruit varieties through conventional methods. All produce is processed at the same unit, which is certified for the handling and packaging of the organic apples. Organic manager, Roger Banks. We've got nine hectares of apples here, and we had another block of four hectares, but there's no frost fighting with that, so we've got no, no fruit on it this year. This orchard's been going for quite a long time. Some of the trees are up to 70 years old, so it's, it's an old established apple orchard. What apples are you actually growing here? Raw Gala, Fuji, um, Coxes, a few grannies, and some of the Pacific series, uh, New Zealand Beauty, uh, New Zealand Rose, New Zealand Queen, yep. So what's your background in the industry? I've been orcharding for about 30 years um, on various properties. It's only in latter years that I've become interested in organics. Um, I was worked on one property where we tried it with stone fruit, which was more difficult, and now I've come to summer fruit and I've been here about six, seven years. So what made you go organic? I think it's quite a challenge, L learning how to do it without the aid of some of the easy chemicals. Um, and we're still learning, and, and I, 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 I think it'd be pretty bold organic grower to say that they know it all. Coming to terms with how we do control some of our problems, we have had problems with codlin, um, how you get on top of those problems and, and I think you can take quite a lot of pleasure if you can achieve your goals um, and, and produce good quality fruit equal in quality to conventional fruit. Are there varieties that suit organic uh, versus conventional? You'd find them on any conventional orchard. Uh, some apples are more resistant to some diseases, some are more prone to black spot um, and some are more prone to powdery mildew and those are our two predominant diseases. Um, but we have got ways of combating both those diseases. If I'm in my car driving past an organic or conventional orchard, what difference would I notice? The, the main thing that you would observe would be the, the lack of weed spray strips. Um, the conven all conventional orchards use weed sprays and it, there'd be very little growth between the trees, whereas a lot of the organic orchards look pretty hairy. <laughs> Some organic units look messy, but this is all part of the process. Grasses and weeds growing under the trees provide excellent opportunities for insects, helpful to the organic process to thrive. Some plants are not encouraged, however, and individual horticulturalists employ some different methods to keep these at bay. Summer Fruits has developed a relationship with a local pig farmer to the benefit of both operations. So how long have you been producing certified organic apples on these properties? We've been going for about seven or eight years. We, we stopped for one year, we gave it up, but we've carried on since. What agency did you use during the certification process? We used BioGrow. When we first started, they were the main organic registering company that was going. What about surrounding properties uh, using conventional methods? Do you have to have a buffer zone between the two? Yes, you have to have a buffer zone uh, that can can consist of a, a space, if it's a clear area, it's probably about 20 metres, otherwise it, ha it has to be a barrier of some sort, whether it's a shelter belt or a windbreak. Are you subject to the same weather hazards uh, as a conventional orchard? Yes we are, we're, we're still um, affected quite badly by frost. Um, one leaf block we've got, is, it's got no fruit on at all because we haven't got frost biting on it. Um, and we use overhead irrigation for for controlling the frost. So do you interact with other organic growers? Do you share ideas? Yes, there is a discussion group and it's headed quite often by the, the local port research 
place because they've also got an interest in the organic side. They see that as a long-term goal for the district. What is the difference between organic and conventionally grown fruit? Size, colour? Visually, there's very little difference. And I think maybe some of the organic fruit is slightly smaller, but apart from that, we, we're, we've got the same goals for size and quality as what they've got for conventional. Where do you see the industry in 20 years from now? I believe at Central here there will be more operators. Some of the grape growers that have moved in are, 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 are growing their grapes organically and I think that's really the only opportunity for apples down here. We, we can't compete with the yields that they can achieve up north so, but organically we can more than compete because we've, we've got the climate with us. The aim is to feed the growing organic export market internationally. Summer Fruits exports around 60% of the different apple varieties grown on site. Local organic apple lovers are not left out. Fruit with small blemishes, making them unsuitable for the international market, are distributed locally. If the apples have too many such blemishes, they are fed to the ever enthusiastic pigs. Nothing goes to waste on this organic orchard. What are the pests you encounter? Codlin is, is our worst pest, um, and then leaf roller to a less extent, but uh, we, we do monitor for both of those. Other pests that they can get on conventional orchards are scale and woolly aphid. Um, the interesting thing with woolly aphid is after you've been organic for a while, the predator numbers build up and it will decline. So we, we can find it on the orchard, but it never becomes a problem. And so what methods do you use to deal with those pests and what's going on behind us here? We use pheromone ties for, our, uh, for the codlin. They emit a, 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 an odour which replicates the smell of the female moth and basically the poor old male moth can't find the female on the orchard. We also can use some virus sprays which are made from natural viruses which also will kill them but uh, they have to be very specific to when the, the caterpillar is on top of the fruit not inside the fruit of course. But we're also using the, uh, we're using pigs the, the, one of the main reasons we're using them is to try and eliminate our weed problem around the trees. Because it's an old orchard, we have got quite a problem with twitch. So what is twitch? It's a grass that's got rhizomes on the root and it can form a complete mat under the ground with the roots. And sometimes if you dig it, you can actually roll the mat back. It's, it's so thick. So that mat basically captures all the nutrients that goes down and, and can catch all the moisture as well. And the pigs fortunately like the flavour of the rhizome so they, they will dig it up and will help eliminate it. I don't think we've got it at the point where they've completely eliminated but it's, it's certainly helping the trees we believe. So uh, do you introduce any insects? We, we do with the woolly aphid that uh, when you become organic if you're not careful the levels of woolly aphid can shoot up to very high levels but by introducing the wasp, you can help take the peak off that. Is there anything you're particularly proud of with the orchard and, and what's your favourite apple? I'd probably like a Fuji as it, 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 an apple to eat. Um, we're, we're very interested with the pigs. There's, there's a lot of disadvantages with the pigs of just physically handling the orchard, but we've, we've got a block of 70 year old trees and I would have written them off a couple of years ago is just being hopeless and the bigger has come back in the trees they look so much healthier and we can only attribute that to the pigs we actually can't find any other reasons. <laughs> As summer fruits can't make use of the chemical sprays other conventional orchardists use they must rely on purely organic methods. The pigs are a very obvious and visual method of dealing with pests Another smaller friend to the organic apple grower is insects. A special predatory wasp is encouraged, as too is the earwig. Both are crucial in controlling pests such as the ever destructive aphid. So what happens over winter? Get rid of all our casual staff, 
and went down to a permanent crew and the permanent crew is also shared with the main body of the operation so sometimes they're up here on the summer fruit operation and yeah at some stage we get down and do the apples as well. How many staff do you employ to effectively run the orchard? Throughout a lot of the year it would only be myself um, but we do need casual labour for thinning and picking and summer pruning. Um, normally have a team of about 10 people um, and we use Vanuatu and labour quite heavily for, those, for that work. Is organic more labour intensive than using conventional methods? Yeah, we haven't got the same range of sprays for, for thinning and quite often we would need more staff for that. And young trees we have to hand weed and, and, and um, even with the older trees pulling the weeds out, things like that. So yes, there is more work. What processes are we seeing here in the packing shed? They were cutting the excess shoots out of the middle of the tree which were shading some of the fruit. It would just allow the sunlight in to colour up the fruit better. So what happens to the apples when they get here? The first part, it, it goes into the cooler and pulled down to temperature um, and then when we've accumulated enough we put it, it goes into the water dump which feeds it onto conveyors and over the inspection belt and then into the um, the computer-driven grader, and, and that sorts it out into the various categories of sizes and, and keeps the local market separate from the export. So does the shed have to be certified organic? Yes, it does. You may sort of see in the background that we're packing stone fruit at the moment, and when that's finished, we have to have a complete clean down of all the machinery and gear so that we can qualify for the organic packing. These aren't apples today, but what else do you grow and pack here? Okay, the shed's used mainly for packing apricots and cherries. Um, we do quite large quantities of both of those, to less extent, peaches and nectarines. They've got 50 hectares of apricots and cherries here, as well as packing for other people. Are those fruits hard to grow organically? The biggest bugbear with stone fruit is brown rot, which we're struggling to find a chemical that can properly control it without affecting the physiology of the tree. If new methods are found, will you grow more fruit organically? We're always looking forward for opportunities, and, and of course if we could grow stone fruit organically, it would give us quite a, an advantage. Green Man Brewery is located in North Dunedin, right in the heart of the student area. The brewery has been certified organic since 2004, with the first commercial brew put down in February 2006. The brewery itself was a going concern, having been the home to another brewer who employed conventional brewing practices. Sales manager Tom Jones. Uh, I started brewing in about 84, back in the UK. Um, just home brewing on a, on a regular basis, just conventional um, ingredients. Um, I started off with, with kits and then, like most home brewers do, get sick of those because it's just like opening a tin of peaches and it's, there's nothing particularly challenging about that. So you, then you, you progress to uh, an old grain mash, which is basically you, you take the, um, the dried malt seeds, you crush them and you get the sugars from them and then you boil them up with the hops. And then when I came to New Zealand, I, um, I started, I, tried, I was looking for ingredients and I couldn't find any. And at that time I was working for a gas company and we just coincidentally, we put a gas pipe into a brewery on Kaikara Valley in Dunedin. So I, um, I asked the brewer there and he said, no, we can't do that because of constraints. He said, but there's a, a good young fella called Richard Emerson who's just started a brewery and he told me about Richard. So I went and saw Richard, great fella. And so he, he nurtured my enthusiasm and passion for brewing from there. That would be about 95. And um, when I got laid off in 97, I took 12 months out to figure out what, what I was going to do. And so I decided to go and do an ecology degree. So that's where the brewing and the ecology and the greenness and the organics all sort of come together. Are there many organic brewers around or are you quite unique and on your own? Uh, there's one on the North Island. There's one brewery that's, that only does organic beers on the North Island. There's one, brewery, one other brewery on the South Island that does organic beers. And there's also a brewery on the South Island that does organic and non-organic beers as well. Now the certification process itself, how involved is that and 
Who are you uh, certified with? We're certified with uh, Assure Quality, um, and it's on our, our latest packaging. That took about five months to, to from, from start to finish, basically. And um, yeah, they're very good, actually. We, we enjoy working with Assure Quality. They're, they're, also, they're, they're also for uh, international sales, too, so they're recognised overseas. Those conventional brewers, are they encroaching on your territory, if you like? Have you found that they're shifting towards that green image at all? Um, there are a couple, and I shan't name them, but um, there are a couple of, of um, uh, they, they see a sort of a gap in the market, but they're still mass produced and I, I guess some of their marketing is, is questionable as to you know, how, how true or how, how not misleading some of their, their wording is. Um, I'd love to go into details, but I think I'd better not. <laughs> Why did you choose to go organic? Is it something that you believe in, or is it a financial decision you made? No, it's something I personally believe in. I started the brewery in, in September or four, as I said, and I've been growing uh, my own fruit and vegetables organically uh, for 20-something years. When I decided to set up a brewery, I was talking to Rod Donald, the deceased, sadly, um, co-leader of, of the Green Party, and um, he, they were looking at investing at some stage, and he said, of course, if we invest, it's going to have to be organic, and, and it was just something that went, of course he does. Enrico is Green Man's German brewmeister. He has a long and impressive brewing background. A four-year degree gained at Dohmann's Academy in Munich and 14 years brewing experience in Germany. His input into the process is all-encompassing. He supervises each step of the brewing process and his efforts are much appreciated by both brewery management and consumer alike. Much of the success of the brewery is as a direct result of his wide brewing experience. Tom, how do you create a good organic beer? Good organic beer? The, the processes are basically the same as, as, as conventional beers. Basically beer is, is our three basic ingredients, the, the, the malt and the hops. Um, the malt is, is sugars basically, uh, natural sugars, and you've got to crush that to let the water in. And then you, you take the liquid, the sweet liquid at that stage. The hops give you the bitterness, which balances the, the, the sweetness of the malt. Brewing 101, the first two minutes of the lesson, basically that. The ingredients are crucial, to, quality ingredients are crucial to, to that process. The malt has got to be absolutely spot on. Otherwise, we get poor extraction rates from the sugars and we need twice as much malt to get the same amount of beer if it's not absolutely spot on. Now, is there anything different you do without giving away too many secrets, of course? Well, apart from the, the addition of, of, of the non-addition of Isinglass, we don't add any sugars because that's a beer purity law. So some breweries add honey or they add modified sugars, which makes a beer cheaper, which is what mainstream brewers do. Uh, and if you go to one or two mainstream breweries, just ask them about how much sugar they put in the beers. Where do you source those ingredients? The malt's coming from predominantly from Germany. Uh, the New Zealand supplier, we're, we're trying to get him to grow that side of the market so that uh, we can go over to more of his because of the, the uh, food miles and stuff like that, because we're aware of that as well. Um, and our carbon footprint as a brewery and, and as a, a bottle of beer. So um, the hops are all New Zealand. The, in fact, the New Zealand hop industry, the organic side, I think it's the biggest supplier in the world. What's the difference between organic and, I guess, inorganic or conventional beer? As far as labour goes, is it more labour intensive to brew a good organic beer? Not, not more labour intensive as such. Uh, we, uh, the equipment that we have here, uh, we're, 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 we use the area that we have really well. We have two vessels that perform two separate functions in the brewing process. Um, the labour intensive side of things, no, not really, not really. But like I say, everything, everything that we use, we have in there, is all ex dairy vats. Don't think we've actually had one made from scratch. So they're all reused as well. So that's the, the bottle reuse and there's the uh, dairy vat reuse. Green Man Brewery currently source their organic malts from Germany because the consistency of supply in the correct volume is reliable. There is an organic producer experimenting with the growing of certified organic malts in the South Island, 
However, they have to plan their crop rotation three years ahead, so until there are more organic brewers in New Zealand, it's not cost effective to consider cultivation at this stage. How has the demand for your product uh, moved in, in that three years you've been operating? We started off with a lager, Best Bitter and Dark Mild, which was in my, business, my original business plan. Just completely mushroom, basically. And we know, like I said, we do nine different styles. There. We range from a, a, a lower alcohol dark beer at 3.5% up to a 7% stout. And we've also got a whiskey beer at 10.3%. And we've also got New Zealand's strongest beer and what we believe to be the strongest organic beer in the whole world called Enrico's Cure and Enrico is the name of our brewmaster. What methods do you use for marketing and distribution? Tastings, we do a lot of tastings in supermarkets and bottle shops and stuff. Uh, farmers markets are really big for us. I go to the Dunedin Farmers Market here on Saturday morning and over summertime I also go to Cromwell Farmers Market. That's on a Sunday morning. So weekends, I don't get weekends or I get weekends but the working weekends. So um, we find that these, these farmers markets are, um, uh, people tend to be a little bit, if you will, greener who, who go to farmers markets and, and we, we satisfy a need with those people and those people also come from out of town as well. And people have maybe seen supermarket, in the supermarket, they might have seen the green man but they've never had a chance to taste it. And then they try a little bit and go, oh, I'll get some of that when I go back. So it's, it's, it's a, a mobile testing, if, if you will, as well, as well as direct sales you know, at the markets. Is any method proving more successful or is it a combination of, of those two main methods of, of distributing or marketing? Obviously it's a combination and we don't have the, um, the, the, the people and, the, and the, um, the budget to actually do an analysis of, of what exactly is working, but we are growing phenomenally at the moment, so it's got to be a combination of, of that that's actually working, you know. There doesn't seem to be much point in getting any, any marketing people in to ask them what we probably already know. And we can currently cope with, with the growth and the demand that we're doing, so it's manageable at this stage. If we, if we found out that, that if we did just two beers and we only sold it to Auckland, we would lose all those and yeah, yeah it would be, it did get a bit complicated. Well that brings me to my next question, can you produce enough and do you have expansion plans? We do have expansion plans and currently we can produce enough. Uh, in these premises we can double our capacity with the uh, purchase of, I think it's maybe two more tanks. So eas easily um, upscalable. Green Man Brewery is a multi award winner. Kelt, gold medal winner at the September Brew New Zealand 2008 awards. Enrico's Cure, named after the brewery's brewmeister, is a limited release beer and won the best of class in the September Brew New Zealand 2008 awards. Green Man's Lager is also a winner. This beer won a bronze medal at Brew New Zealand 2005. Strong is a bronze medal winner at the New Zealand International Beer Awards 2008. Does basic brewing equipment change much? Has it changed much over the years? Yeah, yeah, especially the mainstream stuff. They've, the mainstream have gone uh, continuous fermentation, which it's not batch, batch processed. They're completely different, different characters to, to the beers. Now your bottles, you're reusing the bottles. Tell us about that, that scheme you've operated. Yeah, we reuse as many bottles as we possibly can. Um, I started the bottle reuse initiative in 2004, at the same time as the brewery was getting going. Uh, I did find, or I was finding, that the, the demands for bottle collection were competing, if you will, with my ability to sell beer and to, to get the brewery going and da da, -da. Uh, So I went out looking for, for a partner for that. And Tony Culling, from, he was representing a, a community group, basically. And he came on board, put a lot of money in, brought some plant over from Germany, at the same time as our bottling plant came over as well. And we worked in together, and he's changed the bottle reuse initiative to Smart Bottles now. So smartbottles.com, collect the bottles, I sell the beer, and sometimes it works. Like the van's full of bottles that I brought back from Kaikoura and Christchurch and Blenheim on this trip that I've just got back from. So How many beers do you actually brew? We have pretty much a core range of nine, and we've also got a seasonal beer, and we've got two special beers. One's the Whiskey Bock, which has been matured on whiskey barrel wood, and then we've used that as a stock, if you will, to blend with Best Bitter to make the strong, 
or we blended it with dark mild to make the kelt. So that's one beer, or th two beers, make five beers. So we've also got Enrico's Cure. So at the moment we currently have 12. Now we all relate food to wine. Is it possible to do the same with beer and tell us just generally what goes well with what? You'd probably have to ask a restaurateur to, to match particular beer styles, but generally dark beers and, and darker meats. Um, our keller goes really well with fish and chips, funnily enough, and lager goes great with fish and chips too. Um, wheat beer goes nice with a Bavarian sausage uh, called Weisswurst, or wheat, wheat uh, sorry, white sausage is what it means. Um, a nice hoppy beer would cut through uh, pretty much anything spicy as well, like a nice hoppy lager. Um, I took a bottle of our keller out of the back of the van, it must have been 22, 23 degrees, after, to go with the spicy Thai food that I was eating, takeaway. And, um, and, and the, the, the hops just cut straight through all the spiciness and it just cooled it down nicely. It was a perfect match. What does being organic, do you think, mean for the consumer? They know that they're getting a pure product and there's no contamination in our process or in anything that we, we do. So, so they know that they're getting a top quality product at a pretty good price and, uh, and it's really just nice beer. Just, you know, just try it. Especially the lager and the keller. <laughs> well, that's it for this show. If you're interested in a certificate of organic horticulture or any other course offered by the Southern Institute of Technology, then don't hesitate to call 0800 SIT to learn for more information. We'll see you next time.